So we begin by saying that no matter who you are or where you are in your spiritual journey, you are celebrated here. So let's begin as we do, and that's uh, trying to be here. If it helps to close your eyes, you can do that, or I just want to be, invite you to be here. So open your heart and mind and to wake up. And may grace be in our heads and in our thinking. May grace be in our ears and in our hearing. May grace be in our eyes and in our seeing. May grace be in my mouth and in my speaking. May grace be in our hearts and in our understanding. And may grace be at our ends and at our departing. And I forgot to turn on my notes. So I don't know what to say. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, it's always funny to me to think I teach about awareness and then not to be aware. No. It happens. You know how the moon gets a haircut? Eclipse it. It's the only eclipse joke I know. <laughs> okay, so um, the title I've given this time today is the title, We'll See. Now that is Tennessean for We Will See. And it is a reflection from this present time with my present understanding of my own faith about the importance of patience and persistence and endurance. All three of these skills, and they are skills, they are not personality traits, are essential for a sustained daily spiritual practice. And what I hope to do today in this teaching is to make the central doctrine of the Christian faith not only make more sense so that we can embrace it in newer and deeper ways, but also so that it might contribute to our moving from one cognitive level to another. Okay? Now, sometimes I will ask you if you can hear in here. But today I'm going to ask you if you can see. Marcy, can you see? Can you tell what this is? Can you see? I just show the people in the back you can see. This is important. Because if you take a dollar bill and you fold it in half like this and in half like this and then in quarters like this, when you open it up, what you have is a $20 bill. <laughs> Front and back, nothing else. Okay, you missed that. I'll show it to you again. You take a bill, you fold it in half, you fold it in half again, you fold it in quarters like this, and then when you open it up, what you have is, if I can get it to open, A $100 bill. <laughs> Nothing else. That's it. Now, Marcy has asked me to tell you that if you're going to put dollar bills into the offering plate today, could they be like this? So that's it. That's that. All right. But can you see? And it would be interesting, and next Sunday I'm going to be also begin with another similar thing. Uh, it will be interesting to see how later today you will tell somebody about what you just saw. 
So maybe two of you could get together and share with each other what you thought you saw. Because you couldn't have seen what you saw. Because that doesn't happen, does it? Or does it? Now, you are aware that we're using this theme of living in the sacred stream to uh, accomplish three things, and three things that hopefully at once. One of the things I mean is that growing in a deeper understanding of um, Jesus and his teachings, that's one of the things we mean. And the big focus today is going to be primarily on that, but we'll also go into how we make that applicable to our own lives. A deeper understanding then of who we are and our true nature and a deeper understanding of the flow of cosmic evolution and how this is causing us to rethink everything. Now, I first learned this phrase, we'll see, from my father when I was seven or eight years old. If there was something that I wanted to do, and nearly everything that I wanted to do fell in the category of needing my father's approval or assistance, I would ask him, can we go to the movies? Although in my growing up, we called it, can we go to the picture show? And the answer was, we'll see. Can I go swimming in the river? We'll see. Can I sleep over at Jimmy's house? We'll see. Now, I am sure that time has distorted my memory, but I cannot think of a single time when I asked my father a question and he said any simple yes or no. It was always, we'll see. When? We'll see. If it's okay with mom, is it okay with you? We'll see. And so there I began to learn patience and persistence and endurance. So the doctrine or teaching that I want to explore is the one that we just celebrated in the Christian calendar called resurrection. And I want to give you a heads up that you are likely to hear things about this that you have never heard before. And this may sound for some of you like a graduate seminar in um, the origins of doctrinal development. That's okay. You will, we, it won't last all that long. And um, as my mother would say, just put your thinking caps on, okay? Because I think that you will find this part of the journey not only enlightening, but also enlightening. We'll see. You know, both the Nicene Creed and the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed dating from about the 4th century and the Apostles' Creed dated sometime after that, affirm that Jesus was crucified, dead, and buried, and that on the third day he rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, where he sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. So it is in the Nicene Creed that we learn that God is left-handed <laughs> because Jesus sits... Um, on the right hand of God. <laughs> the Apostles' Creed uh, corrects this impression, by the way. I believe in resurrection, and I want you to notice that I did not use the article, the. So my faith in the hope of a, a new life that resurrection opens the door to does not demand that I believe in the non-mythological literalness of the creeds or that somehow a human body that had been deceased for three days experienced some sort of supernatural intervention from a God way out there and uh, that this deceased body got up and because of an earthquake walked out of a tomb and then could walk through doors and 40 days later wafted up into heaven. In seminary, I call the inability to believe that Jesus went up into heaven a uh, sentient deficit disorder. 
And that's probably another reason that I got fired. I do believe in the Easter event, and I do believe that there is a doorway in that Easter event through which we can gain access to an understanding, actually it's really much, much more than an understanding, that can lead us into higher levels of consciousness development that we've been talking about the last several weeks. Now, it may sound in my teaching that I am interested in criticizing literal religious traditions. I am critical of them, but that is not my primary purpose. I see them as limited and dangerous, but what I really want to do is to make a positive case for a religious understanding that is rich and engaging and energizing and hopeful. So I do want to issue a warning that we are about to take in the next few minutes a step into serious engagement, I underline that word, of the biblical materials about resurrection. Now, I want to caution you that if you have, a, and I've said this before, but if you have a reveal theology, and a, real, a reveal theology is one that holds it that in, in some way the Bible is a special document that was revealed to, given to people, uh, and it's the most unusual, best book in the whole created world, history order, all of that. If you believe that, then what you're about to hear is going to be upsetting. And, and so you can just close your mind and if that's your, what you believe. If you don't have that belief, then I promise you, even though, even then, you're about to hear some new stuff. So just be open to hearing some new possibilities. And um, it may feel threatening, it may feel exhilarating, but most of all, I hope it, will, hope it will open new doors of truth and understanding for us all. Now, I want to be clear that I am speaking all of this from an understanding of the Bible and my own religious history from a Jewish perspective. No, I'm not Jewish, but that's the perspective I want to try to give. And I'm speaking from a Jesus perspective rather than a, quote, Christian perspective. And I think that will become clear in a few minutes. And again, I want to I want to I want to try to open a doorway into sacred mystery through which the life and teachings of Jesus can give us new insight. It's not the only doorway that exists. And once again, I will remind you in doing spiritual work, repetition is not redundant. I will remind you of Sarah Grant's great line it is not the way because Jesus walked it. Jesus walked it because it is the way. It's a very big difference. If Jesus can be for us the doorway into the sacred, as he seems to have been for others in that critical moment when Easter dawned in human history, <coughs> then the faith story can live in new and challenging ways for us in these times. And God knows we need faith and trust and hope in these times. So um, I want to start by giving you a mixed message. I have said many, many times how grateful I am for the religious background and education that I have received. And I am. Um, the church I grew up in was, yes, benignly fundamentalist. It was racist. It was limited. People lived by the best light they had or were open to at the level of development and the environment that they had at the time. But I was taught the Bible by these people, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I am a person who learned to read at a very, very early age. 
And uh, I am also, as some people are not, but I'm also gifted with the ability to read rapidly, and I read a lot. I grew up without a TV or television set, and certainly before the age of um, smartphones and those devices. To boot, my mother was a high school senior English teacher who is the only human I have ever met who had a graduate degree in Latin. So it was common in our house that there was a lot of reading, a lot of books, a lot of talk about language and books and reading. And um, I was reading Paul Tillich when I was in high school. And that's not bragging, I'm just saying. That was just the environment in which I grew up. So in the university and in graduate school and on through a postdoctoral program, I lucked out in having some of the best teachers imaginable. On Easter Sunday night, after being uh, together as a family, we went home and it, we were stuffed and all that sort of stuff as you are on Easter. And I turned on the television set and was going through the channels, and I happened to see that one of the channels was broadcasting the Ten Commandments. And by today's standards, it is just an awful film. <laughs> just absolutely awful. Cal Yates, who was my first professor of Hebrew, and a man who helped translate the revised standard version of the Bible, he was my professor, was a consultant because he was a friend to Cecil B. DeMille on this movie. He was my teacher, just saying. I had great teachers. That was an awful movie, by the way. It's pretty engaging. So I got into a postdoctoral program at Harvard with the best biblical and theological scholars at the time. But all of that was at least 50 years ago. And as foundationally important as it was and is, I look back now and I can see how ignorant my teachers were. Not stupid, but ignorant. Ignorant in the same way that my high school science teachers were ignorant about the cosmos. We just didn't know. And at that time, even at Harvard, they didn't know all that was going on in biblical archaeology, in, in, in linguistic studies, there was no John Dominic Crossan. There was no Jesus Seminar. There was none of that that existed at that time. All of that would come later. So I was raised in the proud, excessively so, I might add, Protestant conviction that anyone was capable of interpreting the Bible. That was a strong Baptist teaching. It was a corruption of an understanding of the priesthood of all believers. Saying that anyone can interpret the Bible is, saying, is like saying anyone can do heart surgery. It's just not true. I don't believe that anyone can understand the Bible, particularly the earliest parts of the Christian collection, without understanding that it is a decidedly Jewish document written using a Jewish way of interpreting scripture in light of a Jewish teacher whose name was Joshua that we've translated to mean Jesus. Now, religious literacy, illiteracy, and stupidity abound in this country. The um, idolatry and idiocy surrounding the Bible, especially as evidenced by the Trump Bible, would be hilarious if it were not so terrifying. By the way, a real Christian billionaire would give Bibles away, not sell them for 60 bucks a pop. That's not all I'm going to say about Donald Trump today either. 
And I want you to think about something, and I'm just drawing from the Easter narrative here, and I'm smashing stuff together from the stories in the Gospels, which are all contradictory to each other, okay? But if you smash all the telling of the Easter event together, you will read that when Jesus was arrested, his disciples fled. They forsook him. And yet, we're given intimate details about what Jesus said, what people in the crowd said, what the two thieves being crucified with him said, what the centurion said. We're told what the soldiers did, what Pilate did, what Herod did in private with just Pilate and Jesus. Now, who reported all that stuff? Where did that information come from? How is there a way to attest to the historical authenticity of any of it? And the answer is there isn't. As I said, the crucifixion stories, there are several and they contradict each other, are the products of a Jewish way of interpreting scripture. Um, and that way is called midrash. Now there are different kinds of midrash. But for the sake of our talk today, you only need to know one kind. The one that we're interested in is called Haggadah Midrash. And Haggadah is the interpretation of an event in light of a story that comes from our history. Now just to anticipate things that are going to happen in the next couple of weeks in these talks. Every word and event that happened to Jesus in crucifixion and on the cross is found in old, what we call Old Testament or Hebrew writings and applied to the Jesus Easter event. Okay? I'm going to say this so much you'll think it's replaced daily spiritual practice as a phrase. Not a word of the Gospels not a single word of the Gospels was written until after the Easter event. That's incredibly important to keep in mind. Everything was written in light of the Easter event by Jewish people who drew from Jewish background. Got that? It will become, I hope, clearer as we go along. <clears throat> <clears throat> the most important or most accessible Haggadah example that I could think of is this, the Haggadah for the Jewish Seder meal. Then this one was given to me by uh, Rabbi Sam Karf, who died a few years ago. Sam and I were friends. He's a great guy. And um, the Seder meal... is a creation of Jews based on events that happen in the past. It's an example of Jewish genius when it comes to liturgy. Shelby Spong says, Midrash is the Jewish way of saying that everything to be venerated in the present must somehow be connected with a sacred moment in the past. Now, because biblical knowledge and understanding as well as knowledge about how to read and interpret the Bible has been largely lost, and I'm going to try to explain how that happened in a moment, people have been left with having to see Easter as one of two things. It is either something that didn't happen it's a myth, it's a fairy tale, something I don't believe in. That's one position. Or the other position is it literally happened. Those are the choices that we have in our culture. But those are not choices that look at the Easter event through Jewish eyes. So keep in mind that Jesus was a Jewish mystic who lived and taught in the prophetic tradition of his religion, which was Jewish, not Baptist. 
Honestly, that's what I grew up believing. Or if you grew up Catholic or Methodist or Presbyterian, Jesus was a Jew. And the, and the movement was Jewish for a century. Marcus Borg used to love to tell this story about this woman who came up to him after one of his lectures and she said, Professor Borg, surely you, are you certain about what you said tonight in your lecture? And he said, uh, what part? And she said, are you certain that Jesus was a Jew? <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> Borg said, yes, I'm, I'm fairly certain Jesus was a Jew. And she huffed up and said, well, surely his mother wasn't. Paul, who is the first person who wrote about the resurrection, the Gospels were written after Paul. Paul, who is the first person who wrote about the resurrection, never mentions anything about an empty tomb or any resurrection stories. They're unimportant to him. For Paul, Jesus was buried... And then he was taken directly up into the presence of God. They lived in a different understanding of the cosmos. And there are Hebrew stories that paved the way for this understanding that Paul had. Didn't happen like that. Happened over decades of time. Mark and Matthew and John were Jews. They wrote from a Jewish perspective for Jewish people. The only exception to this may be Luke, who is now considered by most scholars to be um, what is called a Greek Jew, somebody who had converted to Judaism from a different kind of perspective. Now, <clears throat> there were a, a variety of things that happened that caused Christian writings to be removed from Judaism. The first one was the division that produced the Gospel of John, which is the latest gospel written somewhere probably around the year 90 to 100. Um, so what happened, and this is overly simplified, was that the Jewish followers of Jesus went back into the synagogue and they began to put together their memories of Jesus in light of their Jewish understanding of their Jewish scriptures and some of them began to say that in Jesus, they had experienced God in new life. There were other Jews in the synagogues who opposed this position. And they had a general conference and voted to split. They, they didn't get along. And so they got, they got pushed out of the synagogue, and John's gospel is written in response to that general movement to establish a new understanding of Jesus through Jewish eyes still, but a break from Judaism. That's the first thing that happened that began to remove Scripture from, from Judaism. It's important. The second thing that happened that separated the Christian story from Judaism was Paul's success in spreading the gospel to a Greek world. So Greek notions, Greek philosophy began to find their way into the construction. Much A lot of Paul is Greek and battling Greek influences all around the region where he spoke. Paul was a marketer uh, of the Christ, new Christian story. So the new converts to this movement didn't have Jewish roots. So they didn't see things through Jewish eyes. So that's the second split that happened. Then centuries passed. People couldn't read. Most people couldn't read. The Bible wasn't available until the Gutenberg Press came about. And even then it was not widely available because people couldn't read. But what happened was also that Copernicus came along and redefined what the cosmos looked like. So those who did interpret the Bible said, we can't, we can't see this literally anymore. Well, some of them said that, and some of them didn't. And so there was that split that occurred between the church and the scientist-oriented people. 
So the, the Bible came to be studied in a new way, but it wasn't a Jewish way that the Bible came to be studied. And at that time, people who were studying the Bible said, you know, oops, you know, we really can't share this with people in the pew because they won't understand it. So there you begin to have a split between what's called the academy on the one hand and the laity on the other. And the academy knows all the special stuff that's going on about how the Bible is interpreted and developed and all that. And that split has continued to this very moment in the, in the, in the church's education program. Another huge split occurred at the time of the Protestant Reformation. Because during the Protestant Reformation, um, the Pope was declared infallible for the Catholics. There was a split in Catholicism until the 10th century. And <clears throat> Protestants enshrined the Bible as the word of God. And many began to take it as infallible. And then the Protestants developed a skill at splitting. We, the Protestants, have split into so many factions that it is just incredible. Now, this may be an overly simplistic way of explaining what has happened, but I think it's fairly historically accurate. And um, I feel free to criticize the church because I love the church and I'm in the church. But <clears throat> as an example of the Protestant addiction to splitting, I'm going to take off my theological hat now and put on my psychological hat. The current split that's going on in the United Methodist Church is what we psychologists would call a death wish. It's like analogous to the country's obsession with firearms. It's a death wish. It's an unconscious death wish. It's like fiddling while Rome burns. I can imagine the Jesus of history coming back and looking at our social, particularly the poverty level, the violent level, the dishonest level, the divisive level, the hate level in our country and world. And then hearing about us debate about full inclusion in the church and saying, is this what you think is important? So when we read the story of Easter, the proper question to ask is not, did it happen? But the proper question to ask about, about Easter was, what was there about Jesus? that caused these Jews to incorporate Jesus in their Jewish history? That's the question. There were a couple of phrases that came up during my theological education time. Maybe some of you are familiar with them. They, they were to tout Christian fundamentalist superiority. One of them was the religious right, and the other was the moral majority. <clears throat> the religious right is neither. Religious or right. And the moral majority is growing in number as well as in immorality. So I am inviting you to be open to an understanding of religious faith about Jesus that doesn't depend on an empty tomb, a resuscitated body, angels that descend and roll away stones, a body that can walk through locked doors and then is wafted up into the sky on Ascension Sunday. Now, if this sounds unfamiliar to you, the church owes you an apology because this has been in the teaching tradition for centuries. Now, if you embrace this, it may mean giving up some things like cherished notions, cherished beliefs, cherished doctrines. 
that mean much to you and that you've held on to for a long time. On the other hand, it might be for you new light and hope and possibility as it was for those first disciples. We'll see. This way of faith, just like understanding and living one of Jesus' parables, means living with a faith where God or sacred mystery is, is seen as past, present, and future all at the same time. I have a hat. Actually, I have a lot of hats. I, I, I collect hats. This is about a third of my hats. And I think after taking a picture, I'm glad one of them you can't really read clearly because it's offensive. And I recently got a new hat that my beautiful bride said, please don't wear that. And now I want to tell you that she has given me a lot of hat eye rolls over the years. <laughs> because if you look at some of these, they deserve it. But this is the hat that I bought that she said, don't wear that. She said, it will be misunderstood. It will be misread. You will get shot. I have not worn that hat out. I think it's a great hat. At this year's National Religious Broadcasters Association International Christian Media Convention, where Donald Trump was the keynote speaker, there were other hats for sale. You know, <clears throat> we here, and when I say we here, I'm talking about we here and we in this uh, ecclesiastical setting of St. Paul's and in a little bit larger circle of this metropolitan area where most of us reside. <clears throat> we live in a bubble. It's a good bubble. And I am grateful for the bubble in which we live. But it is in no way reflecting of close to the half of the voting population of this country. Who buy those hats? You know that this is a bubble because <clears throat> I could not teach the class that I have taught so far today in most churches. You're aware of that. And I really, um, one, of, one of my mentors, Carlisle Marnie, once said to me one time, he said, Curly, I hope they never make you president of anything. And uh, the, I, it's, it's, it's a fate I have fortunately avoided. I have great compassion for senior pastors. They're up against the wall. How do they do teaching like this, and even a church like this, without risking? It's, it's tough. It is really tough. So people like Diana Butler Bass, whom, who's been here, um, people like Adam Russell, Russell Taylor of Sojourners, people like Richard Rohr and others that I could name, Brian McLaren, a dozen other people, they, uh, quote, get away with what they do because they're not in churches. They're in parachurch organizations or they're independent. So white Christian nationalism is laying a foundation for and giving power to a growing authoritarianism within this country which is appealing to an increasing number of people. Now, I have to rely on others for what you are about to hear, and I am giving them credit because I don't listen to Fox News. I am not on any social media. So what I am sharing to you come, with you comes from Diana Butler Bass, from um, Jim Wallace, from Richard Rohr, and from other people. These are my words, but I've taken from them. Donald Trump has posted several stories 
claiming miraculous backing for his candidacy and that he is the chosen one and he is likening his troubles to the crucifixion of Jesus. Own this may surprise, on his social media, on his social media, he frequently posts this picture. He is in a trial scene and Jesus is sitting beside him. Vanity Fair, which is not noted for its theological sophistication, opened its issue after Easter with these words. Donald Trump, who kicked off the Holy Week by hawking Bibles for 60 bucks a pop, spent Easter Sunday mired in sacrilege, attacking his prosecutors and political foes and casting himself as a martyr. He promoted a Washington Times op-ed piece that condemned, quote, the crucifixion of Donald Trump. So I am not making it up when I tell you that there are people out there who are embracing a theology of Trump the Savior. They believe it. They believe Trump is being sacrificed for them. I happened, just happened to hear an interview with two evangelicals that I saw on CNN. It's a husband and a wife. They were in an interracial marriage, which led me to assume maybe they would be a progressive sort. I want to quote to you what they said, and those of you with an evangelical background will hear echoes of what you heard as a child in what they have to say. They just apply it to Trump. Now, this was broadcast on CNN. I am not making a word of this up. Quote, the man... The Bible says he was wounded for our transgressions. He did it for us. When Trump is facing all these things, he's doing it for us in our place. Woman, Jesus died for my sins. Jesus died for me. And so I, it connects in my brain that way. Like Trump is doing this for us as a country to make the changes we need to make and he's the target where we don't have to be. So Trump himself claimed at one of his rallies, I am being indicted for you. Folks, this is heresy. It is worse. It is idolatry. One of the people that I see for spiritual direction said to me this week, Do you really know what's going on out there? And I have to admit, I probably don't. And he said, I want to show you something. And he played for me a video. And uh, can we have that video? We ready for that? Do we need the lights down or are we good? Hold on to your seats. Let's say you can wave your Christian nationalist wand. We wake up tomorrow in a Christian nation, a Christian nationalist nation as you're describing, all right? There's a lot of fears that people have. Here's one of them. Will women have the right to vote tomorrow if you wave that magic Christian wand? No. Okay, why not? That, and, uh, that, I want to get into why not. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, because if we had a Christian nation tomorrow and women did have the right to vote, we would not have a Christian nation within 50 years. <laughs> Okay, ex- elaborate a little bit on that. Uh, because the husband has been appointed by God as the head of his home. Mm. And no fault divorce and women's suffrage, more than anything else, ultimately split the household. Mm. So we're not talking about women not having a say in society. We're talking about representative government. That's right. Right now, there are people in Williamson County, Texas, where I'm a resident, who represent me. No one gets to represent themselves mm. in every single scenario. That's right. We are all represented by somebody else, whether we like it or not. 
So why not have women and children represented by a man who loves them and is willing to die for them, mm. protects them, and provides for them? I would love to be represented by just one person in civil government <laughs> who has that level That's of right. commitment to That's me. Good. So it's not about you know men get to vote and women don't and mm -hmm. like no it's about the household vote the individual building block of society according to the word of God is not atomistic individuals mm. it is the molecule not the atom but the molecule of the family yeah the family unit should not be separated what God has joined together let no man put asunder mm. I believe that women's suffrage was just one liberal attempt by people who hated Christ to to sever the covenant bond between husband and wife and that's what happened we would not have one Democrat president this is a statistic fact we would not have one Democrat president in the last 50 years if women couldn't vote so I don't want women to vote because I want strong marriages mm. I want cohesive households I want representative government all the way down to the family. Mm. And I also want babies not murdered. Yeah. I don't want drag queen story hour. Mm. I don't want rainbow jihad. And none of that could happen if women couldn't vote. According to the polls, almost a little over 40% of the country believe that. Now, I don't think it's inconsequential whether Donald Trump does or doesn't win the election. I think it's very consequential. But win or lose, this dynamic is out there big time. It ain't going away. Now, I think my saying much to you about this is like preaching to the choir. And besides, I'd much rather teach the kind of biblical literacy stuff I've been teaching in the first part of this class today. I'm not done with that, and we'll return to it. I want to say more about how the Easter event got morphed into the misunderstanding that it has become, but not to speak to stuff like this as a follower of Jesus is being unfaithful to the gospel, in my opinion. I began the journey that led me to stand right here today in this place by getting involved in the civil rights movement. The civil rights movement grew out of evangelical Christianity. The protest against the war in Vietnam grew out of the evangelical movement. Martin Luther King Jr. was an evangelical Christian. And his model, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German theologian who was executed for being involved in a plot to overthrow Hitler, did so out of a profound evangelical Christian background. What happened? It is the evangelical, that word means good news bearer, bearer in me, that wants me to appeal to you that even though you may think you already are, to follow Jesus and to allow Jesus to come into your heart, not to save you, you don't need saving. The world does. Our country does. Our churches do. And it will be saved by Jesus-like people who have been raised into hope and new life and can communicate that to other people. Part of my own daily spiritual practice is to pray every day that I may be granted more of the resurrection so that that might work in me in every way and aspect of my life. To, the, to me, this is one of the things I mean when I say that I am a Christian. Jesus with me, Jesus within me, Jesus behind me, Jesus before me, Jesus beside me, Jesus to win me, Jesus to comfort and restore me, Jesus beneath me, Jesus above me, Jesus in quiet, Jesus in danger, Jesus in the heart of all who love me, Jesus in mouth 
a friend and stranger. That's my adaption of the Patrick prayer. We need Jesus' people in the world, not people who hide it under a bushel, as he would say, but people who let their light shine. Now, here's another thing about this. Letting Jesus come into your heart, or another way to say that, moving from one level of consciousness to another, is like death. So you better believe in resurrection, or you wouldn't make a trip. So let's say that you have decided to take my, my invitation and you're following Jesus. Maybe you think you've done that for years and maybe that's true, but um, I want to give you a metaphor for what maybe that journey might look like. And I think this is true for any wise and useful spiritual path, but the one that I'm working on in here is the path of following Jesus, moving in the sacred stream in that. So you've decided to follow him. So we have walked together with Jesus for some time, maybe a few weeks, maybe months, maybe years. But we're still here. And um, after a while, we decide to pause and take a break. <laughs> it's a hard work. And so we sit down on a bench or a log or somewhere in the journey. And after a while, Jesus says to us, he nudges us. And he says, you know, I like you. You need to hang out with. I really like you. You're cool. And I'm so pleased about so much you've learned and how you live. And we just beam, you know. He gives us a little hug. And he says, you know, so far on our walk together, you've been pretty much in charge. And hit a long pause and we don't like the way this is going because he says next, um, I won't take over now. And our anxiety goes up because, Lord, we love to be in control. And, and, and he says, uh, you see that cave over there? Actually, that's my tomb. I want you to get up from here and I want you to go over there and I want you to have a meeting with God which is the source of my life and identity, and I want you to get grounded in that too. <clears throat> now, I want to say, interrupt this narrative at this point, to say that so far on the journey, that, you know, the pats on the head and the attaboys have felt good, because they, and actually they've been essential, but we have all along had the sneaking suspicion that sacred mystery is hidden from our sight, you know, most of us. How often as a pastor I've heard people say, well, I pray to God, but I just don't seem to be able to get through like, as if God is off there somewhere. And I think we've had this thought that maybe God herself would come out of the cave and give us a hug and say, you go have a great life. And if you need anything, call me. And if I'm not busy helping a sports team, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> I mean, isn't that the way most of us live? Our most frequent prayer is help instead of thank you. The ego gets just enough juice from daily spiritual practice to keep going, but there's a sharp U-turn in the journey. It's not a one-time event. It's something that happens all the time. That's why I love this book, Always We Begin Again. So at any rate, at some point along the journey, we begin to realize that although we begin it to get something, we are really in it to become someone. And that we're not here to get, but to give. O oh, divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to love as to love, to be understood as to understand, because it's in giving that we receive, it's in self-forgetting that we are found, it's in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are raised to life again. 
So nevertheless, there we sit with Jesus, looking at that thing over there. And we confess to him, I don't want to go. I just don't want to go. And maybe we, how long we sit there? We can sit there until we drop the body, and then some people say we have to come back and do it again. We sit there for, what, three days? Three months, three years. Three is a magic number in transformation, you know. Jesus is in the tomb three days. Jonah in that fable was in the belly of the whale three days. A minister, priest, and a rabbi go in a bar. Three blind mice, three little bears. You know, three is a number of transition. We say, you know, if there's some other way, I'd like not to do this. And then we remember that night... <clears throat> When he tried to cut his own deal. And he said, Lord, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But he added a kicker. Nevertheless, not what I want, but your will. So he nudges us with the elbow. And we finally get up and we start going in that direction. And we're just about to reach the mouth of the cave. And he calls out to us, thank God. Because <laughs> we think for sure he's going to say, just kidding, you don't have to go. Or maybe he's going to say, everything's going to be okay, which it is. But he doesn't say that. Just as we're about to go in, he says, oh, wait, wait, by the way, you can't take anything with you. Not your religious beliefs, not your clothes, not your iPhone, not your economic status, not your educational status, nada. You take nothing. This is the introduction to dying before we die. And though we don't know it now, we will look back on that as the most blessed moment of our life. Now, here's the other thing about this journey. In the morning, we get up and we have to do it again. The question is, will we individually and corporately make the journey? We'll see. And if we do, we'll see. No matter where you go this week, no matter what happens, you carry precious cargo, so watch your step, and I'll see you here next week. Thank you.